I'm even going to hit start, Jim. See? There we go. <laughs> the time's up. <laughs> well, I'm kind of behind the podium. I hope you can all see me. I know I'm a little bit short here. Uh, thank you all for coming out today, and I'm very excited to talk to you all about preliminary fossil discoveries at Comb Ridge, Utah. You probably have heard of Comb Ridge. It's a very popular hiking destination. It's not necessarily known for its paleontological resources yet. There have been some, some work done there, but it's mainly known across the United States, not just Utah, for its amazing hiking, and also there's lots of Native American cultural remains down there. So we're here in Moab, obviously, and Comb Ridge is down here in the southern portion of San Juan County. Uh, it's sort of a misnomer for me to say that it's only here because Comb Ridge represents the southern and eastern edge of a big monocline. So we're, what we are looking at in Comb Ridge, when I refer to Comb Ridge, I'm referring specifically to the BLM administered section of Comb Ridge that runs from north of the San Juan River, the north bank of the San Juan River, all the way up into Elk Ridge of the Abajo Mountains. And it was formed by the Monument Upwarp, just a little bit of basic background geology here for you guys. So you have this enormous plateau that was pushed up forming Cedar Mesa and Elk Ridge and all this. And it sort of is the southern, southern and eastern flanks of this. Been tilted up, so you've got these great exposures of early Mesozoic rocks that are just on the surface there. And they form almost a continuous outcrop belt, which is pretty awesome. We can trace beds laterally for, for dozens of miles in some cases. Uh, the two main formations that we've been looking at have been the Chinle Formation and the Kayenta Formation. The Moenkopi Formation is exposed there. We found some trace fossils, but that's not the focus of this, and we haven't found anything in the Kayenta Formation yet. Body fossils and tracks are known from the Navajo Sandstone, which forms the upper portion of Comb Ridge, but that has been worked on by other folks, and that is also not the uh, topic of my talk here. So this is what Comb Ridge looks like. I think it's relatively pretty as outcrops go. It's not too bad. And when we're looking at the Chinle Formation, we have two members represented there. The lower member is the Monitor Butte member. It's dark, it's a grayish, bluish mudstone. It seems to be deposited in a very low energy environment. We have lots of carbonized plant remains that we find in some of our localities, indicating you had water sort of sitting there and stuff settling out. It's also present further north as well. And we also have the Church Rock member, which is this reddish upper area. And this is roughly correlative to what is present in Lisbon Valley and here in the Moab area as well. If you're going on our field trip tomorrow, you'll get to see some church rock. We've been doing not just sampling for fossils, but also measuring stratigraphic sections. So we've actually done, whoa, I didn't do my animation. All right, cool. We've got four sections. We've done two up in the northern section here, uh, and then one very far south, and then one sort of in the middle here. And we are finding that in the northern portion of Comb Ridge, we have a large sandstone that I'll come back to here in a second that isn't present elsewhere at Comb Ridge. So this is a unique rock unit for Comb Ridge. So here's our, our four measured columns. And you can see that we've got a large channel sand separated by this, uh, this mudstone in between with an interesting conglomerate in, in there. And as you move further south, you lose these sands, your conglomerates, and even your sandstone lenses become isolated. You, you can trace them out over maybe a couple dozen meters and then they pinch out. So this is to give you an idea of, of what we've been finding here. All of these dots are rough representations of where we have recovered fossil remains. Not just vertebrates, we're also finding invertebrates there, including bivalves and uh, many different types of gastropods, several different types of gastropods, rather. But you'll notice that there's a big gap here and a relatively smaller gap here. These are likely due to sampling bias. We haven't been prospecting very heavy in these areas. Part of this is because our program was based out of southern Arizona for a while, and it's very easy to get to the southern portion of Comb Ridge if you're driving six hours from southern Arizona. Not so easy to get another hour up this dirt road into the middle section of Comb Ridge, so that part hasn't been prospected thoroughly. We were planning on doing it this last summer. Unfortunately, we were trapped in camp for about a week by a flash flood, and we couldn't really go anywhere. So we sampled near our camp and ended up with more localities. Here's some of the significant discoveries that we have come up with so far. Uh, the first occurrence of Crosbysaurus in Utah, one of my former students, high school student, and myself published on this last year in 2015. And we've got now more specimens of this Crosbysaurus. At first we just had one tooth, partial tooth crown. Now we've got one complete tooth crown and several other additional partial tooth, teeth crowns that I'll show you here. And they possibly represent a new species of Crosbysaurus that's endemic to Utah, which is pretty exciting. 
Protocovosaurus is this other strange taxon that's only known from teeth. These both were probably somewhat like a plant-eating crocodile. But since we don't actually have any remains outside of the teeth, we can't really say what they look like. Nonetheless, uh, we do have something that is pr Protocovosaurus from Comb Ridge. It's the first occurrence in Utah. This is exciting. We are working on this right now. We have lots of tracks in Utah. You may have noticed this, any of you? Yes, no, perhaps? Yeah, there's lots of, of tracks in the Chinle Formation in Utah, but the body fossil record for dinosaurs from Utah is very, very sparse. And in fact, the few that have been reported aren't really diagnostic as dinosaurs. However, we have several theropod dinosaur teeth that can be definitively identified as theropods. So um, one of my former students and a couple other folks here in the room, Andrew and John, we're working on a manuscript right now describing these and revising the Triassic dinosaur record from Utah. And as far as I've been able to determine, and if someone has other information, please let me know, in the Chin Lee Formation, I'm not aware of another published locality that has this diversity of, of taxa. There are other places in the Chin Lee Formation and in the Dockham group over in Texas and eastern New Mexico where you have a, a large variety of, of different taxa present. But in Utah, the microfossil sites seem to be somewhat more limited, at least from the published record. And here's our, our most prolific one, which is called the Hills Have Teeth. And this is a reconstruction done by Edita Felsin. I believe that's how you pronounce her name. I'm awful with it. And this sort of shows what we think our locality at Comb Ridge was looking like. You had these big phytosaurs. We find lots of phytosaur shed teeth. We have a couple uh, pieces of phytosaur dermal armor here, these big plates on the back, right? But we also have things like these metoposaurs. We have several temnospondyl teeth and a couple temnospondyl chest pieces that we've got from this locality. All these dead plants you see here floating on, on the water. A couple different types of, of fish down in here. We've got bony fish as well as elasmobranchs. And then we've got our plant-eating crocodile friends here, a couple different types. There's even maybe a dinosaur morph over here. This picture's kind of washed out, but... This is a small sampling of the variety that we have here. Here's some of our carbonized plants. And we, as we go into this locality, it's just constant little tiny flecks of, of carbonized plants. Sometimes you get stem stuff, sometimes you get unidentifiable bits, but there's lots of it. So here's our current and full list at the moment. So we've got a hibernant shark. We've got a bony fish of some sort. We just have a scale. We don't have any of the skeleton of it yet. Temnospondyls, including something that looks like Koskinanodon, which is the big metoposaur. It's known from the Chinle Formation. They have these very distinct tusks on their palate. They have two rows of teeth, right? Uh, so these palatal tusks are, are distinctive. And I'll show you a picture of one here in a second. Uh, several different types of archosaur forms that we can't identify yet. Protocovosaurus, Crosbysaurus, Phytosaurus, and then our dinosaurs. Here's our hibernant shark, not much to look at, I know. All of these scale bars, by the way, are one millimeter. So everything that we're getting here is very small. Everything is one millimeter, except for one tooth that I'll point out to you. So this was surface collected by one of my former students. It's amazing the visual acuity that high school kids have. They're going along, oh, is this something, Mr. Gay? Oh my gosh, how did you even find this? This is the size of my pinky nail. So uh, these, these uh, ridges that are along the face here continue on the other side. It's pretty distinct. You can identify it down to at least being a hibernant shark. And I was talking with Andrew Milner earlier this week, and he suggested it's maybe Longchidia. I've got to do a little bit more work on that. And here's our Actinopterygian scale that came from the hills have teeth as well, just an isolated scale. So we're interpreting this sort of as a isolated um, oxbow lake, essentially, where you've got some, some fish activity, some and some things coming in to eat these fish, perhaps. Our Protocovosaurus tooth right here. Our Crosbysaurus tooth that we published on last year. And then here's our new specimens. This is, a, this is my absolute favorite thing that's come out of the Hills Have Teeth locality so far. It's just a gorgeous tooth. It's broken off, obviously, here at the base, but this was a, likely a shed tooth crown. There's a resorption pit in here. And you can see we've got quite the range of sizes of teeth here. They all are, again, one millimeter scale bar but this thing is obviously much larger than this. This tooth form here, this sort of triangular tooth form has been suggested to be a premaxillary tooth from Crosbysaurus, but we can see that there's also some variation in size, even perhaps across the premaxilla. And I mentioned this might be a new species. A couple of the things we are using to diagnose this include the lack of any uh, serrations on this mesial or front surface below about the mid-crown level, and all of our specimens have that. And 
There's also no subdivided denticles here on the mesial surface. The holotype of Crosbysaurus and every other specimen of Crosbysaurus that I've looked at from Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, even in North Carolina, they all have subdivided denticles. So it's not just one bump, 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 but there's several bumps within the bumps, as you were. And none of our specimens have that. They all preserve some uh, mesial serrations or mesial denticles, and none of them are subdivided. So that seems to be unique to our comb ridge specimens. I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with phytosaur teeth. It's, they're pretty much the most common body fossil from the Chinle formation. So I just threw in one here in case you weren't. Again, millimeter scale bar, these things could get quite large. Here's our theropod dinosaur teeth. This is our CF coelophysis tooth. This is our five millimeter scale bar. That's the one I, I messed up on the scale bar with. This is uh, pretty clearly based on comparisons with other coelophysis teeth. It falls within the range of variation for coelophysis. It doesn't fall within the range of variation for crocodilomorphs. It doesn't fall within the range of variation for uh, Rawasukians. It doesn't fall within the range for non-dinosaurian dinosauromorphs. The only thing that even comes close to matching it is coelophysis. So we're very confident in saying this is a coelophysis tooth. This is possibly something similar to Eodromaeus. It falls within its range of variation for both size, serration, density, overall morphology, but it's a little bit less clear. And then we've got two other theropod teeth that we can't pin down past theropoda. This one is especially interesting though because it was digested. Something ate this tooth and presumably the entire part of an animal, right? You're not just gonna pick up a tooth and munch on it. It has no enamel on it and it's heavily pitted, surface pitting that we are interpreting as acid wear from the stomach. And we have several other teeth from this locality that show evidence of being digested. So you had things coming down to this watering hole and then you had other things potentially eating these uh, things that were coming to the watering hole. Uh, and a couple other localities that you may have seen on the map there. Again, this didn't turn out very well. It's kind of washed out in, on this projection, but this is petroglyph camp. There's a bunch of petroglyphs here and we've got this Strange reptile skull bone. I don't know what this is, <laughs> quite frankly. And I'm hoping maybe someone can help me out with it because it's weird. There's this bar here and this big pit. This is a natural curved surface. I, I assume that it's a skull bone and that seems, seems to be the general consensus. But if you've got a better idea of what it is, please come talk to me. I'm very curious about it. Fish Hash Hill. This is, was discovered by one of my former students, Xavier, who's here in the audience at some point. Just a really nasty looking fish. It's kind of mashed up, falling apart, but it tells a neat story because you also have these great mud cracks that are around it. And this comes from the church rock member, by the way. Um, so you had this fish that was living in this environment and then obviously you had a drying event and the fish was no longer able to survive. So a, a pretty neat story there. And then our Northern portion is just interesting. <coughs> Pardon me. So the northern portion of Comb Ridge has a canyon that comes in on the side here called Trail Canyon. And we haven't found much in the way of vertebrate remains there, but we have some great rocks. And this is what we are seeing. This is looking north towards the Trail Canyon area. And the lower slopes here, you have the Moenkopi Formation, and then you get down into some Permian rocks. And then you have a small little bit of Monitor Butte, uh, member of the Chinle Formation. And then we have what we are calling locally the, uh, the Trail Canyon Sandstone, just for lack of a better name, we haven't been able to correlate it to anything yet. And it caps this ridge here. It doesn't appear anywhere further south than about US 95, a little bit further north than US 95. So this is limited to the northern portion of Comb Ridge. It's basically two thick sandstones with a mudstone interval in between. And above it, you get back into the Church Rock member of the Chinle Formation, and then you're up into the Wingate. It's capping the cliffs there. Here is Xavier again pointing to a log that's even harder to see in this projection. But this is really neat. This is the upper portion of the Trail Canyon sandstone. We've come through that mudstone interval. And we've got sandstone down here. And right where he is pointing at, there's a log embedded in this lower sandstone. And you can see that the log was in place while this sandstone was being deposited because you have sediment deformation here. And then you've got this about a meter and a half thick layer of, of conglomerate here. And it's just stripped off part of the log. So you have this very intense, high flow, high energy environment very briefly, and then it transitions back into this sand. So we're interpreting this probably as a, a flood event here down a normal river channel that was pre-existing. And on the upper surface of the Trail Canyon sandstone, we've got some nice ripple marks so we can reconstruct flow direction. This would be a river system that was flowing towards the northwest, which generally matches up with other uh, flow reconstructions for the Chinle Formation in this area of Utah. And you can see that it pinches out that this is a student that's a meter and a half tall, maybe. And you can see that this sandstone is not 
not even as tall as her. This is the same bed. You can walk this bed back up to that carp site that we had where you had a, a meter and a half thick conglomerate in the middle of a tens of meter thick sandstone. So it pinches out very rapidly towards the south. And you can see that here. Here's our closer in views of our stratigraphic sections. This lower sandstone is just pinching out. And the upper section is also pinching out. We, can, we haven't measured the upper portion in the far north yet, but you can still see that there's a definite decline going down since we can actually get to the top of it here. It's pretty neat. There's lots of plant hash in this conglomerate area. There's lots of logs in this, uh, the base of the upper sandstone as you move further south. But no vertebrate fossils yet. Not too surprising considering the high energy. We're hoping that we can find some conglomerates and get some, uh, some decent preservation there. Those of you that are familiar with the Chinle Formation here, you may know that the conglomerates of Black Ledge, the Red Ledge beds, tend to preserve some pretty nice stuff. And we do have some conglomerates, so hopefully we'll be able to add in a few animals in here as well besides our plants. It's possible that this Trail Canyon sandstone represents this bed here, which is this lower, uh, lower sandstone conglomerate, which is the Shinarump. It's also present here near Moab. One of the things we hope to do this summer is go out and try to make these correlations a little bit more explicit instead of thinking, well, maybe it works. This is the Indian Creek area, Bridger Jack Mesa. Future work, this slide's not going to work because it had animations. So our future work, our main goal is to prospect this area here. This is the largest gap we have remaining, and we'd really like to fill in some of these blanks. Essentially, every outcrop we've been out to, we find stuff. So it's just a matter of filling in these, these blanks here. Need to do more work up at Trail Canyon. I'd like to fill in this gap here. And then south of um, Highway 163, we have done no prospecting yet. And so that's the other area we'd like to, like to check out. It preserves the lower portion of the Chinle Formation, the Monitor Butte member, whereas as you move further north, you don't see it exposed very often. And based on the richness of our Hills Have Teeth site, which is in the Monitor Butte, we're hoping that we can see uh, similar richness in this area that has yet to be explored by us. And another big thing for us is stewardship. Look at this, all across our beautiful outcrop, we show up, we're ready to camp, we're just getting out there this summer, and someone has driven right across several of our sites. Someone has left trash at some of our sites. This one, this is a 45 caliber spent lead bullet in the middle of a phytosaur snout that's been shot apart. So someone literally tried to kill a phytosaur. They should have known it was dead. It was too late. Maybe they were putting it out of its misery. But it made misery for my students because then they had to try to reassemble not just a fragmented phytosaur, but a fragmented phytosaur that had been further damaged by human action. So raising awareness about the paleontological resources and teaching stewardship of the area is really important for me and also for uh, my former students that have been involved with this project. And another thing is that current efforts are falling short. There are conservation efforts. Oh, my time is up, except I set it for 18 minutes. So. This is, this is my second, it's right here, it's on camera. So I will finish up my last two slides and I'll have a little bit of time for a question or two. Current efforts are talking about making this area potentially a national monument uh, called Bears Ears National Monument in some, some proposals. And here's Comb Ridge right there, you can see it, it's beautiful in this drop down menu of stuff that you should know about it. There's not a single mention of paleontology, not a single mention. And I can see some of my sites from this view. In addition to my sites, there's other areas within the proposed National Monument boundaries that have significant vertebrate and invertebrate remains that should also be protected. So I am currently engaged in some outreach efforts towards uh, the Friends of Cedar Mesa and the Bears Ears Coalition to hopefully rectify this. And they seem pretty open to it. And I would like to thank everyone that's participated and helped out with this, including my funding sources, CNHA, Mission Heights Prep, Museums of Western Colorado, Logistics, et cetera. Rebecca, thank you so much for everything that you've done. It would not be possible without you. Field crews, of course, excellent. Uh, all my specimens are housed at the Museum of Northern Arizona, uh, and that is going to continue even though I'm working in Colorado now. I would like to make sure that our collection stays together so future researchers can access it all in one place. And of course, everyone that has chatted with me about, I know I've left people out here, I apologize, but everyone that's chatted with me about the Comb Ridge project to date, I really appreciate all your input and feedback. And I think I've got about a minute for questions, if you have any.